This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiecki is largely an opinion talk show. All opinions, comments, or statements of fact expressed by Gwilda Wiecki's guests are strictly their own and are not to be construed as those of the Science of Magic or endorsed in any manner by Gwilda Wiecki, Relmar McConnell Media Company, its affiliated networks, stations, or employees. Welcome to the Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiecka, a program dedicated to uncovering the unified nature of reality and humanity's ever-evolving place as truly galactic beings. For more information on the Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiecka, visit us online at www.thescienceofmagic.net. Welcome back to the Science of Magic a program combining the science and magic of today's leading topics to co-create new solutions and hopefully promote original thought. I'm your host, Gwilda Wiecka. This hour we'll be exploring true connection, the art of listening. My original shamanic teacher, a Lakota elder, continually tried to get me to be still and listen to the earth around me. It makes me nervous to sit still. I don't like the way it makes me feel, I would complain. I've come to realize it's not how being still makes me feel, but rather that sitting quietly gets me in touch with how I feel. The unpleasant thoughts and feelings that tend to emerge when we stop and listen are often unprocessed historical events. The very things that drive us out of the present, disrupt our peace, block our intuition, and cripple our lives. I was the master of multitasking and accomplishment, always doing something. While greatly revered in Western culture, If not used properly, this capacity can become a defense mechanism against unpleasant feelings that shortstops true creativity and expression. On the other hand, if we're able to be still in order to access our inner promptings and creativity before engaging our doing, all we create is not only much more expedient, but greatly enhanced. Once this is mastered, I found that one can be still, present, and doing all at the same time. Now that's truly magical. How can we move beyond the unpleasant thoughts and feelings that block us from our inner sanctum, where true creativity resides? How can we eliminate the anxiety that drives our actions instead of our inner promptings? Our guest this hour may have some creative solutions to these very problems. With us is Jillian Pransky, author of Deep Listening, a healing practice to calm your body, clear your mind, and open your heart. Jillian has taught mindfulness, yoga, and meditation for more than 20 years. She's the director of the Restorative Therapeutic Yoga Works and a guest teacher at many renowned holistic learning centers. Her website, JillianPransky.com. Jillian, thanks so much for joining us on The Science of Magic. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's a real pleasure. What did you do before you were a yoga teacher? <laughs> Before I was a yoga teacher, I was in the corporate world. I was in publishing as a marketing director. That's a long way from yoga. How how, did you make that (laughs) dance? (laughs) It is. Well, I I simultaneously was always an athlete and always um, practicing. uh, I was um, doing aerobics or some sort of exercise or a self-care regimen. And as I was in publishing and pursuing a fast track uh, corporate life. I was moonlighting at night as an aerobics instructor. I was running marathons. I was doing a lot all the time, filling every minute. And one day the 
doing just got too busy and I stepped into a yoga class to find relief and pretty much that's where my path in yoga began. Mm. Who's been influential in your yoga practice? I, I've had many masterful teachers that have um, helped me develop my own practice and share what I teach. One of the deepest teachers in the yoga world is Eric Schiffman, who is just an incredible presence and a teacher on, on being present. But I also draw from many other modalities, very specifically um, Buddhist meditation and Pema Chodron, who is a master at sharing the Buddhist meditation practice. Mm, okay. So you're, you're listed as a certified yoga therapist. <laughs> How is that different from being a yoga teacher? Well, I have spent, you know, the first several years of my yoga practice as an athlete and as somebody who was very ambitious with my career, I used the practice to still get better at things, to make myself mm, better at anything, better at a pose, more, more uh, flexible, more strong. And when I needed my practice to shift with some healing that I needed, I, I began to use the practice very differently. It healed me from injury, from illness, from grief. We're, and we're going to have to pick up on uh, how your practice shift on the other side because it's time for a commercial break. Jilly and I will return shortly, so don't you go away. Super. You're, you're listening to The Science of Magic. Our current episodes are inter internationally broadcast and air daily through the Exxon Broadcast Network, xzbn.net. The Exxon is based in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. In service to our listeners, prior innovative episodes can always be accessed free of charge on our website, thescienceofmagic.net. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the X-Zone Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the Exxon Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. Welcome back. This is the Science of Magic, dedicated to unification and evolution of consciousness. I'm your host, Gwilda Wiecka. Our guest this hour is Jillian Pransky, the author of Deep Listening, a healing practice to calm your body, clear your mind, and open your heart. Her website, JillianPransky.com. Jillian, we were talking about the difference between a yoga therapist and a yoga teacher. Yes. Well, let me, I guess, start by saying all yoga is healing and all all yoga is therapeutic. Um, with the way classes are offered today in our Western world, someone could step in and think of it more as a bodily practice or an athletic practice or as an exercise even in some way. I personally needed more healing from my yoga and it set me on a journey to study with not only yoga teachers, but physical therapists, neurologists, doctors, and putting some mind-body medicine research into how I offer yoga 
to my students, whether it's in a private setting or in a group class, became very much my focus. That is more the focus of a yoga therapist, and there are certifications and many, many hours put into one being able to offer yoga as a therapeutic modality in the same way that someone might go to, say, a physical therapist or an occupational therapist where sessions are really geared specifically towards healing, balance, and wellness that would ever might be needed from that particular person. So that you is know, my focus. I, I've been a body worker <laughs> mm -hmm. um, in historically. And um, one of the things that I found in body work and I also found in my personal yoga practice is that when you get in a particular position that's not familiar to you, oftentimes you can access um, old memories or old emotions. Are, are you aware of that? And if so, are you, how are you equipped to manage it when it happens to your people? Yeah, I would say that that's actually the heart of my practice. And most of the time, it's not only in an active position, but, but rest itself, especially in your introduction. When we begin to relax and slow down and really pay attention, we begin to make room for these emotions to bubble up. And the first thing that I do personally when I'm working with someone, but that I think of as a essential for all people practicing is if we begin by focusing on how we're grounded, how we're landing, how we're literally supported by whatever it is underneath us, then we begin to um, prepare the nervous system to handle more of these sort of unexpected sensations or feelings or memories or images to arise. If someone's not grounded and they're just moving through their poses and something arises, it can trigger much more stress and much more uh, reaction, much more habitual reaction. So step number one is I always bring people's attention to what's underneath them, to support, to their breath. Um, and allow time for someone to really feel uh, the, the actual, um, I'd say ground, the, literally the earth, the earth in their breath. You know, this is a term that's used a lot, be grounded, be grounded. But I don't think very many of us know what's meant by that. Can you go into it a little more, please? Yeah, a lot of times we have this discussion and we think of it as a personality trait or as a mental state. And since I'm offering a physical modality that allows us to integrate our emotions and our, and our uh, mental state is that I, I like to start with physically, what is it like to let our bodies actually relate to the earth and, or, or a chair that we're sitting on or a mat that's on top of the ground. And I don't think we uh, often stop to pause to see how we're, we're held up. I find that that's, true with my students. And um, being grounded can start with how we physically relate to support as well as how we calm ourselves mentally. It could start in either place. So you're talking about uh, the relationship with gravity. Um, well, I, I am talking about the relationship with gravity that I think that we have a way of pushing ourselves forward and holding ourselves up and keeping ourselves together physiologically and emotionally and mentally that we forget that there's also something there to support us. And so it's this, really, it's this very integrated experience. But if we pause and we really drop the way we're holding our shoulders up in our ears or, or racing forward literally physically with time on our to-do list, and we just pause for a moment and we let the ground hold us up, we make room for a very deep breath and it reorients us as to how to move forward, how to handle what bubbles up. How, how do structural restrictions interfere with that? Well, I find that if our body is tense and tight, if we're wound up, if we're pushing forward, we are going to respond to stress with stress. If we are bound up and, and we're wired to sort of armor and protect ourselves and, and plow forward, we are, we're, we're coming to whatever we meet with a little bit of a, a stress response already geared up. If we want to meet our stress differently, if we want to move forward differently, even if it's a stressful situation, we need to change the way we approach it. And for many of my students, getting grounded and making room for the breath helps rewire the way we step into our next moment. You know, I did this interesting exercise where I would... Um, 
observe a person and then take on their posture. And the most amazing thing happened. I would suddenly start feeling the same stress they seem to be reacting to. Oh, uh, yeah. Can you speak to that a little? Yeah, I love that you say that. Um, I teach teachers how to work therapeutically as well as just work with students. And one of the things, that an exercise that I do with teachers is to, when they're working with a student, to try to take some breaths and get sensitive to feel the experience of their student so that they can find a better way to meet where their student is at. Um, but simultaneously, if we take on the stress of others, we can lose our own ground. So how we meet the stress of our student, if we can get grounded in our own bodies as teachers, if we can feel our breath while we're attuning with the state of our student, then we can bring a more grounded presence and a more spacious presence for our student to find themselves in. It's sort of like making space, holding space for the student to feel what they're feeling, but also feel the safety that is available when you're grounded. Yeah, you know, as, as an empath, it's so important to find your own zero rest point so that you can go ahead and empath with others and yet come back to center yourself. And is that what you're talking about in grounding? It, yeah, it is. It is. We could we could get lost in other people's experiences. We can forget our own support. Um, but there's this tricky place be, between wanting to be, um, well, between being empathetic and compassionate, which is a very open, very receptive, very um, uh, connected place without losing our our personal relationship with our ground and our breath that allows us the ability to go in and without um, sort of uh, losing clarity and losing our own um, calmness. Mm. You know, let's back up a little bit. Where did yoga originate? Yoga as a practice? Mm -hmm. um, well, you know, it de really depends on who you study with and what books you read. But in my training and how the teachers have passed it on to me, it is a very, very ancient practice and was first really designed to allow us to be more sensitive and more open to our meditation practices. So the asana and the movements and the pattern was really a way of attuning our body with our mind and our breath. So we could actually sit and meditate for longer states in a more open and receptive way. So opening the body opens the body to this other information? information that is actually always available to us, always inside of us. It's not like it makes us better and then therefore able to get information. We're learning to ground ourselves, to open to a wisdom that is always inside of us and around us. We don't need to qualify for it or be different for it. We just need to learn how to allow our receptivity to open to it. You know, it appear that many mainstream yoga classes, you know, you go to the gym, you go to a yoga class, and in my experience, some of them are a little more than glorified exercise and stretching practices. Um, would you speak to this and how it differs from what you're talking about? Well, I agree. And when I started, um, you know, I was really, as an athlete and as a young person, I started yoga very regularly, a very regular practice when I was 24, uh, almost 26 years ago. And I was attracted to what was being presented as a physical, strong, empowering practice. And then yoga was, you know, populated in gyms and became another one of our offerings under the sort of menu of exercises. But I still think that's a good way to get people in the door and start to integrate breath and movement together, because sometimes when breath and movement happen deliberately together, it's really hard not to feel its powerful effects. However, we get lost in staying present with just trying to get better at poses and a better body and a better, you know, it's, yoga has become one more place we can accomplish something or be successful or get more done. And I am asking people to slow down and have a, what I, what I would call a somatic experience to think less and feel more, to tune in, to, to listen to what's under the busyness rather than to create another place to be busy and get stuff done. So it's different, but it's, it is being done and it is being offered. And it is in the yoga 
but it just depends on the environment and the teacher about how, how much you're going to be sort of invited and led into that place. Speaking of which, how can a person find the kind of teacher they're looking for? Say we want to be more meditative in our practice rather than have it be just stretching or exercise. What does a person look for in a teacher? Is there a certification or what? Well, certainly a certification is a great place to start, although many masterful teachers did not have a certification. So a certification doesn't mean they're the best teacher for you. But I think um, the place to start is feeling um, connected to a teacher is really important, feeling a friendship, feeling a resonance. Um, Also, starting with beginner classes or a restorative class or a gentle class rather than just going directly to um, a vigorous class or an athletic class or or a uh, what might be called a um, hot class or vinyasa class. The other thing I might say is trying many different classes and noticing how different styles and different teachers create different effects for you so that you can begin to make a choice based on your own experience rather than what someone tells you is good or not good. We have just a few seconds left in this segment. What about accountability? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean. Maybe you can elaborate on that. Okay. Uh, Are are yoga teachers held up to a particular standard or is it just... Uh, absolutely. There's there's certifications um, through uh, national certifications such as the Yoga Alliance and the International Association of Yoga Therapists. And those are all important credentials to look for. And I do recommend that you find a studio that's accredited and has certified teachers. I just I just like to remind people, you know, my first masterful teachers that I have learned everything, you know, from didn't have a certification and while it is important to be accountable and have one, it's not the certification that makes a teacher intuitive and brilliant and a healer. It's your relationship with them, your own relationship to the practice and their delivery of very wise and, um, and sound practices. Well, it's time for another short pause. Jillian and I will return to our discussion on the other side of this break, so don't go away. Thank you. We're, we're coming to you through the Exxon Broadcast Network, where new and exciting things are always afoot. Don't miss the other fine shows and hosts on xzbn.net. You're listening to The Science of Magic, your resource for creative solutions in a changing world, thescienceofmagic.net. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Welcome back. This is the Science of Magic a place where magic and science come together to promote enlightenment. I'm your host, Gwilda Wiecka. Our guest this hour is Jillian Pransky, the author of Deep Listening, a healing practice to calm your body, clear your mind, and open your heart. Her website, JillianPransky.com. Jillian, you know, in your book name, there is Open Your Heart. We haven't talked about heart and how it applies to yoga. Let's go there. Yeah, um, open your heart. I guess what I find important to me about including this in the practice is is yoga is a heart practice. It's not um, just for making the body more flexible and strong and receptive or, or the mind more clear, but it's really a chance to attune with compassion and with this feeling of oneness, which for me, love and oneness are very interchangeable words. So how does it do that? <laughs> Well, when we start to feel our partnership with the ground and the breath meeting through our body, and we start to 
relax the ways that we are bound up or keep ourselves separate, we begin to feel a little bit more well, uh, a little bit more whole, a little bit more at ease. And it begins to allow us to um, feel when we're in nature, how we're part of the natural world around us, or when we are with another, how we feel our sameness rather than our differences. Or when we think of what we have gratitude, we can literally feel the softening in our heart. And when our heart is a little bit more available and present and soft, then we're able to allow for all of the emotions that we experience, whether they're challenging, like sadness or a burden of pain, grief, or whether they're actually joy, which for some people is as equally dif difficult to stay soft with as sadness. It's, you know, that we're really making room for the, in the spectrum of emotions. And that is as much yoga as it is opening the body and, and feeling our breath. I'm glad you mentioned that because um, one shamanic principle, particularly Celtic shamanic principle, is honoring the joy and sorrow sine wave. And the, the thought there is the, your ability to accept and receive joy is limited by your ability to accept and receive sorrow. And mm. the more we are softened into both and just let them move through like the weather, the more present we can be and the more empowered mm -hmm. we are. Uh, would you go into that a little? Absolutely. So if it's very difficult to open our heart to that wide spectrum of both joy and sadness when we're tight in our bodies and restricted in our breath. And at the very heart of this practice of calming the body and feeling the support of the earth, feeling our belongingness to the earth, we make room for the breath which calms and clears the mind. When the body is grounded and the mind is more clear, we can soften when we have the instinct or the impulse to harden our heart. We can soften to sadness, to grief, to even anger, to disappointment. And we can soften to happiness and joy and allow this gift of gratitude and love with the same allow allowance as we can process loss and pain. And when our bodies are restricted and our breath is limited, it is almost impossible to open our heart to that, those range of, uh, of our emotional body. And so yoga for me, my wish for myself, my wish for my students, my wish for anybody who I who I share this book with, is that may we feel grounded in our bodies and open to our breath, clear in our minds, so that we can soften our heart to this full range of our emotional experience of being human. So let's let's look at this from the backwards approach. If we don't open ourselves and, and soften into our emotions and let them move through and out and onward, um, then they're stored in our bodies. Okay, so then we store them on our bodies and we have to isolate that those aspects of our body, keep breath away from it, keep movement away from it, so that we don't trigger all that storage. How could a person start to reverse that without being overwhelmed? Yeah, so, you know, this conversation keeps taking us back to being grounded, but the kind of yoga that I do teach, um, it, it leaves us feeling a little bit vulnerable because it is a process of opening. And in order to allow people to get comfortable with being vulnerable, it's essential to get grounded. So whether it's bringing our attention to where our feet meet the earth or our seat meets a chair or our whole body lays on the earth, when we feel support, it's a little easier to be vulnerable and open up and to allow these emotions a chance to unfurl, to look at them, to stop avoiding them or pushing them away or um, rejecting them. So step number one is getting grounded and then we make room for the breath to come in. And our breath, our, our breath is a form of grace. Our breath is a form of, you, you mentioned you are a body worker. It's as if the breath is our inner body worker. It comes in and it, it it meets where we're rigid. It meets where we're hard. It meets where we're held. And it's a form of sort of a greeting, a hello, a, a sense of safety and love so that these areas that are so well protected that we protect our what we don't want to what we don't want to face, what's too difficult. Um, and again, it could be on either end of the spectrum, sadness or happiness. We could harden around happiness in the same way we do around pain. Um, 
But once we find our ground and let the breath come in, then the practice, the practice we're doing is how do we continue allowing the breath to soften us without our impulse to close down over it. And um, slowly we make room little by little, breath by breath in tiny increments to look at what we've been used to avoiding or, or armoring against. Jillian, what happens um, uh, personally, if you've ever experienced this, when you run across somebody that just has more than they can, more than they can ground out, more than they could process, and they start to freak, do you have a referral system you send them to, to, to help them get through that? Oh, absolutely. I mean, the first thing I do personally in that moment is I reground and I breathe. And coming back to our breath is the best way to calm our own nervous systems and then whoever it is we might be working with. Once we get calm in an acute moment, um, there's then the opportunity to share a professional, whether it's a social worker, a psychotherapist, a therapist, and to ask, you know, um, you know, my job is not to do talk therapy. And the beautiful thing about offering a yoga practice is we're usually so tied to our stories mm -hmm. and we're tied to working things out in our head. We're tied to thinking about it, talking about it, um, reviewing it, rewinding it, analyzing it. And the work I do is somatic. It's how do we breathe and make space? And the story bubbles up. My job is not to dialogue, nor am I nor am I um, certified to do that. Right. But I invite people to continue that on their own. My other tool that I use myself and offer my students is journaling. Mm -hmm. And it is amazing to journal after um, release and to have an opportunity to dialogue with ourselves. You know, we have so many more answers inside and so much more wisdom. And we know so much more than we think we know. Um, having a good mirror, having someone to talk to, having a professional person, especially when anxiety or trauma is involved is essential, but also remembering that there's a tremendous amount of wisdom that we can um, access within ourselves through journaling, through breathing, and, and through working together. Well, you've mentioned this word a couple of times, so why don't, why don't you tell us about it? What exactly is restorative yoga? Restorative yoga is um, rather than the type of yoga that moves us around a lot and asks us to be active and engage our muscles and create movement, restorative yoga is much more receptive and still. It might look like a resting posture or a deep relaxation. And in a lot of ways, it's more like meditation than it is like a movement practice. They are longer held poses. They can be anywhere between five to 30 minutes, depending on it was how you off the floor now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, you know, you say that. And what, what is interesting is people think it sounds delicious. And they think, oh, that sounds like a glorified legal nap. And it is. It's a legal rest, which we all need permission to rest. But what happens when we finally rest and if we're really, truly, consciously relaxing, what's going to bubble up is everything that is easy to overlook when we're moving and easy to avoid when we're in our agendas. So when we finally rest, the first thing that happens is um, we're anxious. We discover that our mind is busy, our bodies are anxious, we're tight, we're overwhelmed, and it's, it's way more fun to keep moving or just way more easy. Um, I find that restorative yoga people think of as you know, old people's yoga or injured people's yoga or tired people's yoga. But to me, it's the most advanced practice. Mm. Mm. You have to have be willing to know yourself, though, don't you? You have to be, well, you're meeting yourself. You might not, it's, it's the courage to be intimate with yourself. It's like having a true visit. And I just came back from a retreat this weekend that I led. And my best friend from 12 years old happened to be a student on my retreat. And it was easy to use this lesson is that if my dear friend Nicole needed me and wanted me to listen or to talk or to see her or hear her or validate her, I would show up as a loving, compassionate, open presence. But if I needed myself to do that for myself, it would be very hard and tricky and difficult to show up for myself in the same way that I would be willing to show up for a loved one. 
restorative yoga is the process of learning the skill of how to visit with ourselves and show up compassionately so that we can begin to unwind all of the armor that keeps us stuck in stories and keeps us stuck in firing our stress and keeps us moving through life habitually. And, but yet we've been trained in that in our entire lives, haven't we? Our entire lives. Yeah. Yeah. And everything around us reinforces that. I mean, I, there's and some... not, and not, I'm sorry, but I was going to say, and not only, um, you know, some of it's well-meaning. Our parents want us to do well. Our parents want us to have more. Our parents want us to have a good life. And so our agendas and our racings reflect their wishes for goodness. So it's not even that we're on this, um, you know, packed, fast, uh, striving life uh, for bad, you know, for, for, for the wrong reasons, but then society tells us we should have more, get more, do more. And then our nervous system is wired that we believe that in order to stay safe and be well, we have to keep making sure we're okay. And that involves keep looking around, doing more and preserving ourselves in some way. So if we want to rest and do nothing, we sort of have to rewire everything, our belief system, our nervous system, but that also only rewires when we do rest. So it's sort of this catch-22. It's We're learning how to do less in order to rewire our nervous system and doing less or, or rewiring our nervous system, I should say, also allows us to do less. So uh, we're going to have to take another quick pause. But on the other side of it, I would really like to talk about being, uh, doing more, being here and doing less. So Mm -hmm. we will pick up with that interesting little subject on the other side, but we do need to take a quick break. So before we pause, let me remind you to check out the amazing upcoming galactic shamanism classes for both children and adults on www.findyourpathhome.com. Jillian and I will be back shortly, so don't leave us now. This is the Science of Magic, your resource to altruistic professionals of science and the esoteric, working to create common ground for the betterment of our world. Join our email family to receive our amazing topic-driven episodes at our website, thescienceofmagic.net. Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the X-Zone Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the Exxon Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. Welcome back. This is the Science of Magic, bringing together gifted people of service to the world. I'm your host, Gwilda Wiecka. What's up in your world? I always love to hear from my listeners. Email me at info at thescienceofmagic.net and suggest a topic or a guest that's on your mind. You're probably not the only one interested. Our guest this hour is Jillian Pransky, the author of Deep Listening, a healing practice to calm your body, 
clear your mind and open your heart. Her website, JillianPransky.com. So Jillian, we were just about to talk about how you can be um, uh, being here and doing less. Yes. Um, well, I am I'm just like everybody else who's probably listening. I'm a mother of a 14-year-old. I'm a wife. I'm a yoga teacher. I'm a meditation teacher. I travel a few times a month. I, I know what it's like to have a busy life. And um, I'm as, I have as long as a list of things to do as the next person. But it's not so much that our list will get shorter necessarily. It's how we meet our list and how we meet the moments of our day and our stress that creates space in our life and allows us to um, respond to what we want to do rather than act habitually. Not everything on our list needs to get done and nor does everything on our list require us to handle it stressfully. So when I think of being here and doing less, a lot of it has to do with how we show up for what we do, which can allow us to slow down while we're doing it and be really present with each thing we do, which allows us to not only feel slower, but we wind up making wiser choices and actions, which then we might decide, I don't have to finish this, or I don't have to finish that. And organically, we begin to sort of prioritize in a way that we feel that the choices we're making of what we're doing are um, wiser and more essential, I should say. I had this wonderful experience quite a few years back. Um, I got run off the road into a bridge and lost my short-term memory for two years. Wow. <laughs> I say it's a wonderful experience because I was left with no short-term memory, and therefore I, I was always in the moment, totally present with what I was doing. And I found that whether it was beating an article or talking to my children or no matter what I did, it had much more quality and much more effect in the world than before the accident. Um, is this what you're talking about? And would you speak to that, please? Well, yes, in a lot of ways. And first of all, wow, that's pretty incredible. And um, what one of the things I'm talking about is literally just the task at hand. So, for instance, this morning I was blow drying my hair. And I might be blow drying my hair with my shoulders and my ears and like rushing through blow drying my hair as if it's going to dry faster. <laughs> then if I what? Uh, then that doesn't I work. What? <laughs> right, right. And so my body will be really tense, and I'll be like moving the blow dryer, and and it doesn't change how fast my hair dries, but it certainly changes my experience of blow drying my hair. And when I would be finished doing that, I'd sort of be ready to rush tensely to the next thing. When I notice that my shoulders are in my ears, and I drop them, and feel my feet on the ground, and I feel the brush going through my hair the process of blow drying my hair becomes a calming practice and a breathing practice. It's not going to get done any faster. And that might be a really utilitarian example and something really simple to do, but being present and relaxed in the same activity that would take the same amount of time allows me to enter the next activity differently. I blow dry my hair in the morning. So my next activity is meeting my son and my husband for breakfast how I move into the breakfast table will either be rushing from my hair or from this experience of being present with my hair to really being available for my son and my husband at breakfast, which could also be a tense thing because we're all trying to get out the door. It's the same amount of time. We have the same 20 minutes, but how we use Use this 20 minutes, if our body is calm and our breath is deep, will be much more artful. Less coffee will be spilled. Less voices will be raised. Less bodies will be tense so that as we enter, as I go to my yoga class, as my husband goes to work, and as my son goes to school, how we then move out into the world to be present for our next moment will also be different and so on and so on. And so by the end of the day, what could feel packed and tense and creating more armor because how you go through the day either leaves you feeling more stressed or more safe and relaxed. Same day, same amount of activities, how you go through it will change how you feel about it. And so we can be here and do less by slowing down, feeling our bodies, constantly releasing tension as we move through our day 
to be more present. You know what I've found also, Jillian, is that when I'm present, um, time goes slower. Yeah. <laughs> There's more, more of it to do in. And the people around me tend to shift and settle in more. Have you found that? And why do you think it works that way? Oh, absolutely. You know, one of my favorite teachers, I think I already mentioned Eric Schiffman, but I believe it, it was him who said, um, we become, you know, we, we do what we're interested in doing. And we can become what we do. Wait, I'm sorry. Here it goes. We pay attention to what we're interested in. We pay attention to what we're interested in, but we can become interested in what we pay attention to. We pay mm -hmm. attention to what we're interested in, but we can become present with what we pay attention to. And in a lot of ways, that's slowing down. So we're not going to like everything that we come into contact with all day. We're not going to want to pay attention to it. But if we pay attention little by little and we show up more, whoever's with us in that moment, whatever kind of presence we're bringing, we will have a more receptive and sort of nourishing presence with whoever we're making a connection with, which allows for a more organic, spontaneous, authentic experience in what can really happen rather than rushing and trying to get to the next thing that we might be interested in. And I find that I make connections throughout my day, whether it's with my dog or nature or another person, to be much more meaningful, whether it's seeing them in the grocery store or actually having a conversation, whether it's a glance, a word, or, or passing somebody in my car. If I'm slowing down to pay attention, whatever exchange I'm doing is better for them and better for me. Mm. You know, can a person be listening deeply in the present moment and doing at the same time? Absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, that's really where the practice is going to go because our lives are about doing. We are moving through this life. We're not going to be sitting still for most of it unless we're sleeping. And the idea is that if we practice being receptive, if we practice being grounded and present, then how we do, how we move through our life will not only be more mindful and compassionate, but we will start to create the lives that at are more heart-centered. They're more a reflection of what, how we would like to live. You know, another thing I find fascinating is how when we can settle back into the present moment, our IQ rises by about mm, 75 points. Have you noticed that? Oh, well, I didn't know that if that's true, but it feels like that. <laughs> Not literally, but it feels like that, yes. Sure, yeah, we have a lot more wisdom to access. And we feel a lot more of the others experience, meaning whether it's my, you know, whoever I'm in contact with, it's not just my own agenda. I'm now more attuned to what, what's going on around me. And that that's wiser. Right. Cause you, aren't we normally just really split? We're either carrying the baggage from the past or worrying about tomorrow and just barely present in the present. Absolutely. Well, that divides our IQ in three parts, doesn't it? It does, yes. <laughs> and our energy and everything else. It's amazing. Everything. Yeah. Uh, how do you find that yoga can help this form of yoga, the restorative yoga, can also help the body become more aligned so that it can better carry the spirit? Well, um, I'm very interested in how the nervous system works with the body and both on a scientific level and on a spiritual level especially because I do a lot of yoga therapy and most of my work is with anxiety and stress and um, panic, that when we rewire our nervous system to be more calm and when we relax, we set up the body to be more present and be more open. And we can begin to feel our experience, feel our heart, feel our gut, feel, the, feel, the, feel our body in the space around us more. When we can feel ourselves inside and around us more, we start to feel the energy that, that permeates um, each other that is not you know, so individual to us. We start to feel our sameness rather than our differences. We start to feel our belongingness rather than our separateness. And this all leads to the, the spiritual experience, a, a sense of love, a sense of belonging, a sense of sameness that is, is a bodily experience. And if you know the work of um, Jill Bolte Taylor, she also had a, she had a, she had a stroke actually, but it affected her memory and it affected the use of her brain. And she discovered, she's the author of um, my uh, stroke of 
my sh stroke of insight, I think it's wow. called. Um, and she talks about how the brain itself, how we're wired to have the capacity to, through our neurology, to understand our our sameness, our part of the environment. And I think of it as a spiritual experience, but I also think of it as the capacity of being human, that we actually are wired to have a sense of connectedness. That sense of connectedness is really the bottom line, isn't it? Because when we're connected, there's nothing to be afraid of because it's all part of the whole. Jillian, it has been absolutely wonderful sharing this time with you. And But unfortunately, we are out of time. Thanks so much for being on the program and for all you bring. Thank you so much for having me. My pleasure. Thank Our guest this hour has been yoga instructor and the author of Deep Listening, a healing practice to calm your body, clear your mind, and open your heart, Jillian Pransky. Her website, jillianpransky.com. This has been the Science of Magic. Join our email family to be the first to receive our thought-provoking topic-driven episode collections at thescienceofmagic.net. Until next time, dear ones, may you be blessed with knowledge and comforted with love as you listen deeply. Thank you.